Well, what I'd like to do first of all is to say welcome to Glasgow, Father Donald Dore. It's good to have you here in Scotland and thank you for coming to talk about uh, this anniversary that we're looking at of Progressio, uh, Populorum Progressio. And I wondered if you would answer a few questions that are just a little bit related to that and, and we can perhaps explore some of those issues. One of the things I want to ask was what measures or values would you place at the top of your list for prom promoting integral human development in, here in 2017, 50 years on? That's a very interesting question. I think I would put uh, concern for the environment first because I think that all the other questions about justice and about economic development and all, any other kind of human development all have to be situated within the wider, uh, I suppose, the environment of the, of the ecology. And just to specify that a bit more, I think when addressing the ecological question, for me, I think the first part is to be able to help people to allow nature to nurture them. That we tend to think, well, we have to care for nature, and that's very true. But where are we going to get the energy to do that unless we are kind of fall in love with nature? And that's what Pope Francis actually asks us to do, and to let ourselves be lost in wonder and then of course we want to care for the, the, the all of nature and nature isn't something that's out there different from being human we're part of nature an integral part of it so i think that one of the key things that has happened since that encyclical popularum progressio which is about human development is situating it within the wider context of care for the earth as a whole so that the way i would put it now is that integral human development is merged into so to speak in into uh, integral ecology which is the phrase that pope francis uses mm. now all of the other values are extremely important hugely involved of mm. course but so i'm not playing them down i'm so i'm not saying this is the highest value but it's something like it's the the context in which everything else needs to be located right and how do we how would you advise us all to approach that because it sounds very appealing but as a church, as, um, as members of different organisations, um, how, do we, how do we grow that feeling of, of being at one with, with nature? I'd like to just make a little prelude, so to speak, to what I want to say. It may look as though I'm talking mainly now about the encyclical of Pope Francis Laudato Si, and I'm slightly embarrassed because I know the context is about popularum progressio, but nevertheless, I, it's not at all playing down everything that's in popularum progressio. I think it's enormously important, but I need to say these other things first, so to speak, if that's okay. Yes, so, because mm. we're moving on. Mm. I mean, this is that's why we're thinking about this th that document that mm. was um, written fifty years ago. It's what is concerning us now and how we approach mm. um, that development. And so that's you know that's what interests me about how we mm. how we try to achieve that. Well. Uh, trying to get on to answering your question, I would say, of course, the obvious thing is getting young people out into the, 
beautiful. I mean, Scotland has so much. The, the Highlands, a little bit I know of the Highlands. And, uh, I climbed some of the, the hills and things like that. And it is, I mean, it nourishes everybody. And uh, so getting young people, I think, is really very, very important. And they will convert us, or we working with the young people become more converted. So that's where we might get the, uh, that's a starting point. It's one of many different starting points. I mean, there's a whole lot of other ones. Uh, personally, myself, I'm involved with a group that's dealing with a totally different issue, it would seem, which is about the uh, women that are being trafficked for sexual exploitation. And I think it's very important for a man to be involved because most of the people that are campaigning on this issue are women, and it's been a big, big issue in Ireland. We've just managed to get uh, the, uh, the the law changed. To, we're adopting what they call the Swedish model, which you probably know about. Mm. That is, instead of uh, being an offence to sell sex, it's an offence to buy sex, yes. to, yeah, all that. So I'm just mentioned that as kind of almost at the other extreme. But even that needs to be located within the wider thing. The whole issue about uh, the injustice in the world, uh, how people are vulnerable, why they're vulnerable, of course, is because of poverty and all of these other things. And <laughs> the poverty is getting worse. And it's partly, as Pope Francis points out, because of the ecological issue. I feel the need to say this to kind of balance up uh, the other thing that it might just seem goody goody stuff to be getting out into the, the sunshine and into the highlands. Well, you 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 say that there, there is all that other other stuff, and one of the things that I was looking at was um, Cardinal Peter Turkson who is the head of the new dicastery. Now, we're all very interested in that because um, we are, are looking at uh, what's going to happen to Justice and Peace, to Skiaf, to Missio Scotland um, under this new uh, dicastery and how we're all going to work together and so on. But um, looking at what he was talking about, he um, his uh, um, number one issue seem to be um, to curtail arms dealing. Um, that was top of his agenda um, when he was talking recently. And um, I was just wondering well, what power has the church and the laity to combat such a, a huge industry that is impacting so terribly on many, many different parts of the world and is being blamed for the the famine that we're seeing in, in Yemen, for example, whereas in other parts of Africa it might be about a, 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 the, the ecology, as, as you've mentioned, but with Yemen they're saying that a lot of it is, is to do with them actually being starved to death rather than that they are starving. And the arms um, industry seems to be co com, um, contributing hugely to this. What can we do? What can we, how can we achieve um, something against that industry? Well, I see two aspects to what you're asking. One is why should Cardinal Turkson be putting this one so high on his agenda. And then the other one is the practical question. Mm. So I'd like to say something about the first one first. The really important development in the last couple of years is this move towards Christians committing themselves to nonviolence. And I would suspect that it was in that context yes. that Colonel Turkson was talking about that. There was a conference last in March of last year and uh, Pope Francis' message on, on war on peace, the, the New Year message on peace, is very much along this line. And this is, a, I think, a huge breakthrough. Uh, so the going against the arms industry would be just one small part of that. Uh, that here, I mean, a billion people, if a billion people were committed to uh, nonviolence, I mean, before this, uh, it, the Quakers and the Moravians, a few people like that, have been big into that non-violence. Mm. And they have had a huge influence, even though their numbers are small. So 
if we were in, into that, we Catholics and mainstream other Christians, it would make it could make a huge difference. Now, the other aspect of the question is, how would we do it? Mm. I think the first thing is we would have to take seriously the call to be Christian, and. I think we'd have to get our act together. I mean, I find it quite shocking that, if you don't mind me taking the example of the United States, the hierarchy seemed to be extremely divided between very right-wing people who are largely aligned with the Republicans and so on, and then there's more liberal people, more Pope Francis type people. If they could get their act together and give leadership, I mean, there's a lot happening in spite of them, but it is really in spite of them. Now, it's easy for me to just make a judgment about them, but I have similar kind of judgments to make at home in my own country. And the our leaders, I suppose we're leaders too, but we're not giving the kind of leadership that would really inspire people. The, the one that is obviously giving that kind of leadership is Pope Francis, and you can see that he's one of the most powerful people in the world, precisely not because of what he's saying, but what he's doing and the lifestyle he's living and the, the way he's challenging an awful lot of the inherited uh, restrictions that were, were on a Pope. So if we could all be as authentic as Francis, that would make a huge difference. It would, and he has made such a, a contribution not just to to catholic life but to uh he seems to appeal to to people across across the world whatever faith or all faiths and none mm -hmm. um so there must be some seed within us that uh is responding to that interestingly um he is is the first Pope who has used social media in the way that he's using it. We're seeing a very different kind of use uh, from across the water in, in America. Um, it can be used for, for good and for bad. Um, in some ways it's, it's kind of um, seized, social media has, has seized uh, control of the fight for social justice. There are petitions, there are campaigns and so on. Um, is this just um, the kind of, of rebellion, the kind of rabble that um, the original um, documents uh, about um, social uh, about Catholic social teaching, we're trying to kind of say to people, um, you know, don't rebel against your your employers, don't rebel against your governments, and 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 so on. Is is social media acting out that that rabble rousing that was going on then, or does it have some kind of good um, purpose behind it? Do you think Do you think it's going to help us in some way? Well, the <clears throat> There are aspects of your question that I can't answer because I <coughs> see myself as a kind of practical theologian, but about the, those kind of issues about uh, social media, is it replacing other things? I leave that to other kinds of scholars <laughs> and so on. I, I don't want to be pontificating on that. <coughs> but I do know and I do believe that the campaign, some of these campaigns, I know I've signed up for three different ones myself, for the Avaz one and for the 350.org, and there's one in Ireland, I've forgotten what it's, Uplift or something. And uh, what I like about those kind of campaigns is that I can choose, I don't have to sign up to everything that they take, I have a choice each single time. Mm. And that increases my freedom rather than lessens my freedom. Uh, and it. Uh, it jogs my conscience too to have to say, am I in favour of this particular thing that's coming up? Uh, so those are the, I find, 
if my I'm also a bit involved because I was talking already about the question of the trafficking of women, and I'm on a subcommittee that tries to produce material for the website and for Facebook, but. It feels to me that the whole use of the Twitter in the way that it's been used, especially, as you say, across the water, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that, and I, I, I'm uneasy about a lot of that. I'm ancient, like I... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yes, but they, they say that the silver surfers are the ones who are, are being quite influential. Um, I think that... Um, we are told uh, that we're all living in our own bubbles, our own media bubbles, and that perhaps um, those of us who are, are signing up for those kind of petitions are perhaps in a very different bubble from those who are shouting obscenities at each other across the ether. Um, but perhaps uh, those social media outlets do have some kind of uh, role to play in, in perhaps promoting true Catholic social teaching. Um, is, is it a is it a tool that you would use? You're, you're clearly, um, although you say that you're ancient, you're saying that you do use these tools. So do you think that they have a they could have a good role? I use some of them. The ones that I've mentioned, mm. uh, certainly those campaigns and uh, Facebook and website stuff. Uh, I I balked a bit at uh, Twitter, and I haven't used the others. I kind of linked in those kinds of things. I'm cherry about giving away a lot of information, but I trust Pope Francis and the people around him are decent, the better people around him, uh, and if he's using uh, Twitter and all these other ones, I say well. As we say in Ireland, more power to you. Like keep it up, uh, and uh, I'm sure it's, it it appeals to a lot of people. Uh, so yes, but I I can't do everything. Like I, I yeah. yeah, I'm satisfied <laughs> enough with the bits that I'm doing. There's a lovely poem by Tagore, uh, and uh, it's kind of saying. Just at the time that I thought I had kind of come to the end, and that now is the time to relax, new horizons open up before me, and it's uh, he's he's thanking God for this. Like, and I'm a bit like that. I, if somebody had told me even two or three years ago that I'd be preparing material for uh, Facebook, <laughs> I don't use Facebook for myself, but I use it for the this uh, um, our website on the act to prevent trafficking stuff. Yes. Yes, and I'm sure that that can be very successful. Well, uh, we're afraid to, almost afraid to do the analytics about uh, it, probably not as widespread, not reaching as many people as we'd like, but we're working on it. Yeah. Well, try us. <laughs> Let, <laughs> get, get us in on the act and we'll perhaps try and, and, uh, and spread the word. Um, here in Scotland, we've been, uh, as, as everyone is uh, across the world, seeking to uh, go forward through interreligious dialogue. Um, but as, as you've kind of hinted, when there are people um, who are extremists, whether they're extreme Christian or extreme Islamists or, or whatever, um, their vo voices are inclined to, to drown out uh, the, the ones for justice and peace. And so, how would you go about bringing people um, to the discussion table? We had um, a, a visit uh, recently from a cardinal who, who is uh, at the UN and says that the UN now is, is, uh, is encouraging such interreligious yeah. dialogue and, and bringing people of, of faith into their panels and and so on it, it, it people um have we have we lost the knack of of talking or do you think that this is a, a new beginning as as you're seeing there are new horizons opening up do you think this is one of them well once again like i don't want to pontificate on what might be the sociological things like is one replacing the other all of that I'm in my own little bubble, 
uh, but uh, having said that, I think that uh, what's going on in the UN, I know some of the people there that are uh, the religious groups that are campaigning, like Franciscans International and all these other groups. And uh, I had a brother working in the UN for a long time, so I, f I feel that's really, really important. There are areas opening up on that whole thing. But you were saying the question originally was how would I do it? I just, uh, well, one of the things I think interreligious dialogue is enormously important. And I kind of say to, say to whenever I have to talk about this, especially even to myself, that in a way the most important interreligious dialogue is what's going on in my, inside myself, my own head and my own heart to kind of be able to put myself in the shoes of, to understand, to say, the hardest one, I suppose, for most of us is Islam. And to, to experience what does it mean to be Islamic, it means to be submitting to. It seems to go against everything that's, that Western culture stands for, that I'm not submitting like. And to be submissive to God and to, try to experience the deep value in that and where it's, uh, it doesn't, uh, all the, everything that's important, there's always a paradox in it. You can never just say this, you have to say there's this and then there's that. So I have to be completely submissive to God. At the same time, I have to know that God wants me to stand up and say, this is what I believe and this is what I stand for. And there isn't any easy way it's crazy in fact to try to put the two together there is the um, the image i have is of of juggling that i throw this stick up in the air and this this is the one that's about me being uh, saying god what are you doing like and then the other one is the one that uh, rumi for instance who is a sufi mystic and he says be totally just utterly helpless and then not claiming to know anything because if you say you know it, you're, you, you don't know the reality you're dealing with as a mystery. And if you say you don't know it, you're shutting the door. Like You just have to just be there, uh, dumbfounded, zero, he calls it, zero option. And it's exciting, but so that's the first, I don't, when I say first, it doesn't mean in time, but no, no interreligious dialogue will, can be at work for at all unless there's already that prior kind of openness within myself to to listen to what other people are saying and doing. Um, I uh, I'm very enthused about it in principle, but I haven't been deeply involved in interreligious dialogue. I, I did have a, I'd spent three years of my life uh, way back. 50 years ago, studying everything that uh, John Wesley wrote. I wrote my mm -hmm. doctoral thesis on John Wesley. So that like, gives me some sense of, at least at, in, at the inter-church level, the, the, I mean, basically, I'm a, I'm, I don't want to say I'm a Methodist, but I'm a Wesley. <laughs> Do you <laughs> know what I mean? I, he brings together the Protestant and the Catholic thing together so well, and I have the sense that the same is true, say, of Buddhism, or the same is true of Islam, or any of these things. But I haven't been very deeply involved in interreligious dialogue. Uh, but I think it's the way forward. There's no doubt about that. And again, Pope Francis is so good on this. Mm. Yeah. And and really just respect for each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's that there's need, I mean, there's horses for courses, like, there's need for uh, respect in all of us, but then there are there is need for specialists, and the two specialists would be of two kinds, I think, there's the more theological or kind of theoretical ones, but there's also the practical people that are sitting together, it might be on housing, it might be tenants rights or something, and actually working with people on the ground that are uh, from maybe in a country like this that are immigrants and have a different background and working with them. Mm. Just work together as, yeah. as neighbours. Yes. Yeah. So like respect underpins both, but both, I mean, everybody, I can't do everything and uh, it's, it's nice to be able to say, 
They, you know, that's, uh, also, one of the things that I like, uh, uh, as I've grown older, when I was younger, I, th I thought that my job, in a way, was to put a label on everything, like, this is good and this is bad, and uh, <laughs> uh, oh, being very judgmental, without realizing it, just that seemed to be, to be the way to be human. But now I see that about 95% of things are just there. And the, the, the few things that I need to make judgments about, and uh, there's a few things, maybe 5%, and I would like to be wrong about some of them too. <laughs> well, um, perhaps if, if we all reach uh, that kind of wisdom, then it would be a better world. <laughs> Well, I don't know whether I call it wisdom or, or nescience, not knowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking of, of, of reaching certain ages and so on, we started off by talking about this 50 years of that particular document. Um, what would you like to see um, happening in another 50 years' time? You're, you're, you're going to celebrate, what, 130 or something like that by then. Um, and what would, you, what would you like to see um, ha happening in terms of the, the human um, integral development? That, that, what, did, what would you like to have seen that movement now? having achieved in another 50 years time do you think we'll have got anywhere or will we still be saying well we thought about this 50 years ago and now we're going to try and do it all over again or do you or do you have an optimism that we are actually gently moving in the right direction that we are giving people their place in the world we're giving people their dignity we're giving people a, a place in the world. Is it happening or, or, or not? I don't have optimism, but I have hope. Hope is a gift from God. Optimism is a kind of human calculation, I think. Uh, it may not be, you know, completely worked out, but basically it's, uh, it's just me judging. So I'm going to give you what is, I think is a hopeful response. But actually, it sounds very negative. So the first thing I hope is that we will survive, that we will be still a human race in 50 years' time. And that uh, second thing is that the gap that we have, that uh, that half the human race won't have died. I mean, we'll all have died, but I mean that uh, half of the people will have starved to death or have been marooned uh, because they're not allowed in and their countries are underwater or something like that. I mean, the, the, the realities of what we're facing is, are absolutely shocking. Uh, that uh, just taking a go, moving away from the ecological issues, just uh, terrorists, uh, if they don't get nuclear weapons of some kind, they, they get all kinds of poisons and there could be whole countries or massive populations of people wiped out. Uh, so I have to hope and pray that we will survive. I would also like to hope and pray that a lot of the species of animals and plants that we have at the moment will survive because they're, they're being wiped out very quickly. Uh, elephants, I don't know, it's something like 90% are already gone. Uh, so... Uh, being hopeful, I have to, uh, trying to be optimistic, I would have to be unrealistic, but trying to be hopeful, I can try to let in the, the, the reality of the threats that are very, very real. And not, uh, yeah. I hope that, uh, it's very hard to hope this, that the gap between the rich and the poor won't have got even far, far worse. The direction we're going is that um, it's getting wider all the time. I hope that civilization will survive. 
I worked in Uganda at one stage at the, for a short time at the end of the Idi Amin regime. And uh, what happened there was similar to what happened at the end of when the Roman Empire collapsed. We went back to subsistence living. The sugarcane and all the, the crops for export, they, people burned them because they'd, the government was just so corrupt and dreadful and people went back to living on the local garden that they had. And I hope that that doesn't happen so widely. I hope that, that civilization will survive. I'm not quite sure that I want uh, the present model of Western civilization to survive. Is that enough? It is indeed, but would you agree with me on one just last word then? Should we be putting our face into action? <laughs> of course. Um, we can't uh, just sit back, we've got to put I, it. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Like, uh, the one thing I suppose in a way that, that has to give me hope is that Jesus faced, he lived at a time of the most extraordinary, exploitative uh, imperialism, like, uh, you know, something like 6,000 people crucified during his lifetime in a, along the road. And uh, that, how could Jesus be non-violent and how could he have hope and bring hope if he could do it, I have to say, uh, we, we can do it. It's hard to believe that we can do it, but that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think in practice for me, it also means uh, being recognizing that I have to be guilty for being part of a culture that is, and a civilization that is so, unjust and so uh, exploitative that uh, and uh, I can't uh, can I should I, I need to ask those questions should I try to opt out of it or what should I do but at least not to blind myself to that reality and to feel if there's such a thing as a healthy guilt it's not just a kind of a damaging psychological thing, but a driver of, of anger about the, the trap that I'm in and making some effort to try to, serious efforts to try to live as Jesus did, maybe, maybe not at the radical life that he did. That, I mean, it, it comforts me to, to know the scripture scholar says, yeah, he invited some people to follow him, some women, some men, to, to give up everything, but others, it seemed like Mary Magdalene and, and Lazarus and Martha and these people, they were living there in Bethany, like, and they were friends of his too, so not everybody had to go the whole hog, so to speak, or maybe there are different hogs that you can go on, so to speak, if that makes any sense. But to try to, um, try to be authentic and not to, not to just delude myself and uh, not to yeah, hide the questions from myself. To be, to be active and to agonize without being an agonizer, if there's something like that. Yeah. To be cheerful, to be, and at the same time, not to be naively optimistic. It's, it's, that's the challenge, I mean, that, and if Jesus did that, he kind of said, look, follow me, and uh, he talked about that reign of God that was very real to him, and he nurtured that uh, at night, I suppose, mainly, and uh, it enabled him to, to continue, and he had that sense of being loved with a kind of uh, dearly beloved.
child of God, with whom God is well pleased, that could kind of see him through, even through the agony. Uh, and uh, so we need to, I need to have, uh, to let myself uh, experience in some degree something like that in order to be, continue to face the, the darkness. Father Donald Dore, thank you so much and I hope that you enjoy your very, very brief stay here in Scotland. Thank you, Marion. Thank you.